Buenos dias, senor. I feel I'm on another call as well, so I've got to mute that one. This is where it starts. <laughs> <laughs> Bouncing on the calls at the same time. Gee, you're yeah. retired, aren't you? You're supposed to be relaxed. <laughs> what the heck is this? Uh, well, I was pleased, Phil, to see that we could uh, we could tell where where uh, Eveline's GPS coordinates were at least. Okay, good. I haven't looked at that file. So she sent you the, an updated thing. Is it? Um, yeah. Is the new one file working okay? Yeah, I was able to open it in in Google Earth and see where the it was, and and also open a couple of the other reference files so we can see where the rest of the system is and have it in context. So. Oh, good. I uh, well, my computer crashed on me a couple weeks ago. I it killed all my applications, so I haven't reloaded a Google Earth on here yet. I guess I better do that. I was, gonna, I was just gonna run her file the other day. He goes, oh wait a second, I don't have Google Earth anymore. I guess I better <laughs> wait like a little time to go do that. So um, I'm not sure if you talked to Luz about this, but as I understand it, they made the purchase for that one piece of land, which includes a partially built building on it. Um, that seems like they think it's got a pretty big roof on it. Um, oh, there's Frank. Hi, Frank. Um, hey. 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 My, my long absence. Uh, congratulations <laughs> on your new addition to your family, Frank. Yeah, thanks. Dominic says hi. Hey, buddy. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh my <he> gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, great. That's terrific, Frank. <laughs> What a beauty. I, I <laughs> what a wonderful, him. handsome guy. <laughs> yeah, he's lovely. He's lovely. He's really great. Yeah. I try to take him when I'm on uh, phone calls, gives my wife a little break. So oh, that's great. <laughs> and and as long, he may contribute to the phone call too. So let's just, uh, <laughs> I have a mute button over here. <laughs> Well, I, I have the uh, the ICP reviewer SCC going on on another uh, screen over here, so I've apologized to them for my careless muting, and I'll see if I can avoid doing too much of yours. Oh. <laughs> okay. Wow. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, well, um, actually, uh, Frank, one thing that, that Phil was just mentioning to me is uh, the CAPS has uh, purchased, although th they've made the payments, so they have the property adjacent to the uh, the pro to the well site. And uh, Phil mentioned that there is a uh, that in conversation with Luz, and I had heard this before, there is a partially built uh, house on it, which may have some roof structure available for us. One of the okay. benefits is we can avoid that house and its potential conventional pit latrine being a spitting distance to our, our well, and instead yeah. can plop one of our rotary funded uh, uh, composting latrines in there if need be, if they need anything. So, so a couple of points about that though, is that um, it's apparently got a lot of trees on the property. So that's one of the reasons that, that they'd like to put it on the roof if possible. However, they said there's also an, another piece of land that is even right there as well that has no trees on it. That would be better because it's not shaded at all. That would be a, great. But the owner that's uh, asking a little bit too much. So they're still in negotiations with, with the owner, but they would like to go buy that property also. Okay, makes sense. That's good. And those, so those are the properties like right adjacent to the well site. Yeah, I don't, I mean, since. I thought the one that they already bought was right adjacent to it, but now they says, oh, this other plot's even more adjacent or something. So I don't, more adjacent. I don't know, about, yeah. I don't know Actually, what we, we, we should press that should be on our list to get specificity on just how these properties are located. So we understand from a siting details what's required. And uh, uh, Phil, one of the things that I... Uh, that I uh, had shared with uh, with Frank earlier when I caught up with him is I, I didn't elaborate on the conversation with Eric, but we Eric telegraphed pretty clearly what he wants in terms of documentation for the solar work. 
because the last thing I wanted to do was have something be done that he was not happy with. And he basically wants a, a field memo and then a package that basically shows the design and includes some simulation uh, modeling of how the, the tank storage behaves uh, while we're pumping. And so uh, he joked uh, saying, uh, and I to told Frank, he said, well, he steered me to these sections of Volunteer Village and said, since Larry and Frank had been instrumental in writing those sections, they would know exactly what he was looking for. And so Frank <laughs> and I were joking about that. <laughs> uh, that's karma, that's yeah. the well, karma. The, the manual itself, just reading through it, is just kind of a nice overview, it seems like, about how to approach solar systems. But I, I didn't get as far as looking to see if there was a nice design package that one could point to and say, oh, that's what we want. But I suspected that Frank Berg has done a few of those in his day. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's funny. You know, I, I was kind of the lead off. Well, I was the original chair of the Energy Standing Content Committee. So I kind of started that in 2011. And as such, I, I wrote the kind of solar manual that became kind of the solar recommendations and guidelines for all chapters. And then that was later adapted, I think, by Larry Bentley into a water pumping guide, um, which I was not directly involved in. But yeah, anyways, Larry, between Larry, and myself and Louis Wolfenden we have, and Lando Roberts, we have our fingerprints all over all that stuff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, and I think we're, it kind of comes together with my earlier, um, more narrow request was that we figure out just how many panels we want to request from grid, along with enough documentation that they, they don't feel like it's just an out of the blue ask, but can see it in context. So maybe the, the pathway here is just, and, and I'll, I'll do whatever I can, but I'm certainly not the, the intellectual powerhouse on this, but anything I can do for pulling pieces of this together or getting this document together, because I think the CAPS is now pressing us like, okay, where would, where would we cite this? How does it fit onto our land, et cetera, et cetera. And right. Francisco is, well, when do I go pick up the panels? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, which is all reasonable, and and yeah, yeah, hate to hate to be slowing them down. Obviously, they have a lot more urgency around it, and um, yeah, it kind of stinks to be the bottleneck. So yeah, um, let me look here. Um, well, the other new thing here, Frank, since you've been gone, is you know we basically had to commit to. Um, Bamosa's original plan that we already signed the contract to. So they already went and installed this two horsepower pump okay. um, in, in place. So we've got quotes that if they give us a solar pack, the quote they gave us includes a new pump. So they'd have to, I mean, their standard way of doing it is, hey, remove this other pump and here you go with a spare, I guess. And okay. um, put in this other new one that's more adapted to uh, working with solar panels. Or I still have a question is, is there a way that, that maybe it's not optimal, but in order to save the money of a new pump, could we still have solar adapted to work with this pump that's been installed there? Yeah, seems like that would be the way to go. Um, do we know what's different about the pump? that comes with it? Actually, I, I have a call and it turns out that Filberto uh, uh, has left Franklin and taken a job with Schneider Electric. So he's pleased about, about the big bump in pay. But uh, when his email clinked, I, I then called and he said, well, send me the info on the existing pump that's been installed. And then when I tried to reach out to him today, he said, I'll get back with you. Just, you know, I, I tried to call him and he messaged, you know, can I call you later? So, uh, but he, in his earlier remarks, had said, you know, there are Franklin pumps and there are Franklin pumps. So if you don't have the Franklin pump that says it's part of a solar subdrive package, don't worry. There's a Franklin pump that we know enough about that we can tell you what, you know, what solar package is appropriate to drive it or what subdrive. Or maybe there's another inverter that's different than, than the solar, than the subdrive. One of the things, Frank, that we got from uh, Edward is he began, or Edgar began backpedaling that that he didn't think the subdrive would necessarily work when it's got solar input and from the grid input for AC power. And we, we heard him say that and went, uh, you know, that's whether you're driving it with a gen set or you're driving it with power from the grid the, the, to the device, this should be not that big a deal. But at any yeah. rate, we, we did through some stuttering. That's why we're paying for it, right? I mean, that's, yeah. that's exactly the feature that we're paying for. So, um, 
Yeah, that would be that would be very discouraging if that was the case. How, yeah. Why would it possibly be the case? I'm trying to imagine what scenario when, where the grid power is going to be worse than having a generator. I, I, it just uh, it doesn't compute, and it it's just seemed to me that it was. Uh, he he was still talking about it in the context of uh, well, it still would be good to have a different transfer switch as opposed to having the subdrive uh, solar pack do that that switching between solar and between the 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 grid or swap the grid for another uh, AC backup source, maybe like a generator set. So I, uh, I think the, the key question for me is, as long as we can pick, uh, and, and maybe we need to think it through a, a little more carefully, but as long as we can say for that particular already installed pump, here's the right Franklin uh, subdrive for that, that powers it up uh, and can accommodate it, then the question is, do we want to go ahead and pay a slight premium uh, for just getting the sub drive or do we pay the and get a small savings for getting a sub drive, a motor, a new pump, and then that's all just a spare that we don't use, the parts of it that we don't need? My suspicion is that um, if you get these, the pump that is designed for solar stuff, it will click on on a lower power coming from the solar panels. The pump that's already there, it maybe requires a higher threshold before it will kick in. So it may only work um, eight hours a day compared to 10 hours a day, which, which is one that the solar design pump might work. But I'm just speculating. No, that's what we would hope, right? We would hope that that integration, it, it exposes more of the power curve to the solar energy. Um, well, again, without hard evidence, you know, that that's why I would, that's the only reason I would accept such a solution, right, is if that was the case. Um, you know, the, it, I guess what I'm thinking about is, you know, maybe, maybe there are limitations on the, you know, having the, the, the grid, it makes sense that there would be limitations on having the grid and solar on at the same time if there's some current limited element in the device where if you're using the grid or the genset to supplement solar that you know, beyond a certain, you know, total power, the thing can overload itself. Um, but if it's transferring to either solar at one time or grid, that wouldn't be the case. Anyways, um, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world to have the solar pump and to have the other one as a spare. Thinking holistically mm -hmm. about the project, that part puts the community in the best, best situation. Um, Nevertheless, uh, it's yeah, it's it's a financial pill to swallow, um, you know, to the project. So just, just trying to see how they would use the spare. So say we did buy the solar package, put in, so pay them to pull out this existing pump and put in this new one, um, and then for some reason that one fails. So they'll still have to. They can't go and do it themselves. They still have to call the pump company to come back out there. I guess the only savings is they don't have to wait six weeks to go order a new solar pump. They've got this other one and they'll say, well, for the next six weeks, you have to go on grid power until we back order this solar pump for you. And then we're gonna come out another time and charge another couple thousand dollars to go and install this other one, so. Well, I'd hope they'd be able to retrofit. At, the, at that time, the, the cost of a new pump is more than the cost of a retrofit, right? I mean. Like if the pump is a Franklin pump and they figure out the subdrive. Okay, um, yeah. If we if we can figure out the subdrive to make that work, yeah. Yeah. You know, and we can explore, although it's not and we haven't really looked at it this way, but you know, I mean, I, I grew up as a kid on ranches in Wyoming and we we pulled wells and replaced windmill pumps. I mean, it's not mm -hmm. rocket science. Uh, you know, it's and if you uh, if you when you look at our 2016 assessment trip, the well contractor that came out and did the pump testing, he just had a kind of a tripod frame, you know, big stuff that with a winch and that's what he used to, you know, to drop his, uh, after he took the hand pump out, he, he used it to lower his, his submersible into the well and the casing down with it and, and then uh, did his pump test and then drug it out and restored the hand pump. So, I mean, it's not inconceivable that the caps could develop that capability, but they don't have it now and they might not be comfortable doing that as opposed to, you know, when we have a, a, a pump installation vendor like Bomosa, 
who's a phone call away and can get out there with you know within a few days so right at any rate i digress on that no fair enough um, yeah makes sense so in terms of of next steps what do you guys anticipate as as being the the best pathway through on this i can still try and and get Philberto to uh to comment and give us his his take on given that franklin nameplate pump that's in the that's in the well now which sub drive is recommended or he may flop and and i may not get help from him you know he's no longer with franklin uh he seemed very helpful and very interested i don't know if cesar the franklin rep in uh in nicaragua is willing to take another run at it when he approached and talked with edgar he got kind of stiff-armed a bit with hurt feelings like, oh, the Franklin operation here is trying to hmm. step into our contract and get involved here and complained a bit. He said, you know, that, he, that Cesar said he wasn't very happy. <laughs> but yeah. nonetheless, he did give us a better price uh, for the package unit, the whole pump motor uh, uh, sub drive and flow switch than we had for the one line that he had in the quote before. So something good happened about it. And so- okay. Well, my thought might be to try to follow up a little bit more with Philberto, or if that doesn't work, I've got this Franklin Field rep out in Visalia yeah. that has helped us yeah. before. I can touch base with him to see it. Because by knowing if we can make it work with the existing pump, then maybe we need to size the solar panel differently than if we were using a pump designed specifically for the solar stuff. So it may be yeah. a little... Yeah, the, the crude rule of thumb would be, and, and I know that the Berkeley students did a nice job with their spreadsheet and, and all of their, you know, um, calculations. The crude rule of thumb would be, you know, you want double the solar as the nameplate of the pump. Um, so uh, two horsepower, 1.5 kilowatts is what I'm seeing on the nameplate. Um, so you want uh, three kilowatts of solar panels, which is about 10 panels. As long as these things are coming for free, you may ask for two spares, call it 12. Well, they're 270 watts each, so yeah, 12 anyway, and then maybe a couple more. Okay, so 12 plus two spares, something like that. Yeah, okay. I mean, that, and, you know, we can go back to the, to the Berkeley numbers and, and, and dissect them again, just to make sure, but that's the, that's the easy answer. Got it. That's, yeah, we were thinking 12 to 15 or something, so that's right in line with it. Okay. Ironically, I don't mean to digress. Uh, if we have anything else on that, I have a kind of random aside from these past two weeks to share yeah. about parking. Oh, well, we're eager. So I'm so I'm on a project for USAID in Haiti, the Haiti Water and Sanitation Project, and I'm retrofitting a couple of the like national water utility in Haiti to, to hybridize their systems, which had always been. Well, long story short, they have like a. $100,000 debt between the water utility and the electric utility in Haiti. So the electric utility unilaterally disconnected all the water infrastructure from the grid all over wow. the country. And so they're paying for diesel. All the water utility is paying for diesel in all these big cities. So I'm, you know, hybridizing three of them for solar. And the one in the town called Wanamint, Haiti, had these three pumps in the ground from a company called American Marsh Pumps. I'm like, I have no idea who is American Marsh Pumps. So I called these guys on their website and they and then they confessed that oh actually those ones based on the serial number they're just white labeled they're just franklin pumps and we just <laughs> put our sticker on it so we don't actually know what those <laughs> pumps are. <laughs> and, I, and i immediately thought of this project and i'm like i'm cursed you know now i've got a retrofit <laughs> I'm gonna actually retrofit a franklin pump in haiti and i have no idea what to do <laughs> well, here's one more anecdote for you in terms of Franklin pumps. The one in Belize at August Pine Ridge for their water supply system is a seven and a half horsepower, uh, 90 GPM uh, uh, system that they're currently paying a thousand a month to pump water for the community of August Pine Ridge, Ridge which has eaten them alive. They, uh, they're yeah. unable to extend service to others. And in the pandemic, when people have suffered economically and can't pay their power bill, they're loath to cut them off. But so they're very interested in solarizing this. And so I'm, I, I met a, another Rotarian who was 10 years old when she lived with her uh, family in Belize, who would lived there for decades, uh, the same year that I met my wife, Kathy, uh, in Belize. So uh, we joked, maybe we can see about getting a Rotary Global Grant together to try and service this 
project. <laughs> So wow, we shall see. <laughs> but Franklin pumps are the common denominator across all these as near as I can. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, in Haiti, it's they're eighteen point five kilowatts each, and there's three of them. So you know, wow. larger. But um, same same thing. And I was like, oh my gosh, these Franklin pumps are haunting me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the oh, thing yeah. that's spooky too about Haiti. I don't know if you're if you ran into it uh, with your work there, but uh, we have a a Rotarian here uh, in in uh, in our area that had a long and distinguished career as general manager for Zone Seven. Her name is Jill Durig, and she is wired in up to her hips with the Haiti hand wash uh, Rotarian initiative. That over the next few decades to bring potable water to everywhere in Haiti, and so they're busily out coordinating, uh, you know, with. Uh, with the, the ministries, which I think must be difficult at best to do in Haiti. So hard. Uh, I mean, so hard. you you worked there with the microgrid outfit, right? I mean, I don't know if Phil yeah. knows that background, but that was a fascinating story. And uh, when I yeah. I visited uh, Frank over on the way to the Oakland airport at the it's at the San, San Leandro yeah. old GM plant or something yeah, like that. Exactly. Yeah. It was the biggest maker space you've ever seen, Phil. It's like the top floor of the old GM factory. <laughs> yeah. It's full of it, makers. <laughs> right. No, it, it, just to give you, a, one of the tenants of the first floor is a Home Depot. One yeah. of the tenants. One of the tenants. And, oh, wow. and the second, <laughs> second floor is a maker space, but because it was a car plant, you can drive down all the hallways. They're all paved. And it's like a parking garage big enough to drive cars through the hallways. Um, <laughs> There's a lot of Burning Man and stuff like that, but yeah, I mean, there's like an Office Max and a Home Depot and like six other tenants on the first floor. But at least it was close to Drake's Brewery too, right? So uh... Drake's Brewery is one of the tenants. That's, yeah, right. That is one of the first floor tenants is Drake's. Oh, golly. Well, you guys, what, what else should we cover in this? I, I don't want to... I don't want to waste your time. It was just delightful to see Dominic there in your arms, Frank. That's We're so trying cool. to get him to stay. She's <laughs> close. Quiet too. Yeah, yeah he's we'll have to get. Better. We'll have to get our other Dominic Molinari to join one of our solar calls or something, so he can see right. a namesake. <laughs> right, right. Maybe there's a resemblance. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> so i mean a, a couple of other tasks to looking at we we had talked a, a while back and when we had eric on the line about the mounting for these things what kind of brackets so if, if we still have rooftop is still on the table here so what kind of brackets what's the what's the requirements that we need to find out about the roof if we can do the the loading on it the mounting Great. on that yeah and, so whether it's flat or pitched um you know and then how it's supported um, you know, we may need to seriously beef up their rafters to handle wind loads. I, I don't I suspect the average Nicaraguan house was, to, you know, the, the, the weight of the panels is not much. I mean, you're talking three to five PSF, um, you know, even all wet, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not adding a ton. Um, but the, uh, the uplift force could be, could be severe, especially during storms. Um, so it's a matter of, you know, beefing up rafters and ensuring that the, they're tied into the, you know, into the foundation with adequate support. So um, what are the right questions to ask? Who, who would be the right person to um, look into this? Yeah, um, I can put together a list of questions or, I mean, the other, the other important thing is going to be azimuth. If it's a tilted, if it's a pitched roof, is it oriented north south or like what's the direction of the slope that'll affect the solar yield and the the other thing just to throw into this mix is uh since i, I think i've mentioned this a, a time or two uh we have a separate funded uh rotary global grant project that's that's slated to deliver about 80 although it'll be less because of inflation composting latrines and instead of doing the classic dual vault urine diverting ones that we've done 111 of so far with EWB and rotary funds. This time I wanted to explore a, a simpler wash module that minimizes structure, but I, I, Javier ran out of gas, he and his team in terms of providing structural support. I didn't pulse our project management team to see if anybody had spare cycles. So Steve Crow's team from the Guatemala country office is on a fee basis for me, this is on my dime is got one of his guys uh, taking a look at the, the solar structure. And I've said, I want this, this, this 
simple shed type structure to also be able to accommodate these specific solar panels that we're using. And the, the intention would be as if, um, if, for example, if this, if this residence with its potential found roof wasn't available, that we could use that sort of a structure to do the first few of these, um, uh, these wash modules with composting latrines there as kind of a demonstration place, because I'm not asking Steve's crew in Guatemala to, to t provide a detailed set of construction documents, but to make sure that we've got the structural calcs and we've got the connection details and some schematic sketches. And then we can use our NGO folks to, to prototype those with builders and see what what people like the best, see if they like this. They may go back to their old, they may prefer the old dual vault ones as opposed to this. So we'll okay. see, but that would give us another rooftop mounting option, Phil, in terms of- uh, Well, how big is that? Is that could put maybe two panels on it or something? It's, it's, I'm thinking of it like a, I like mocked a double it up outhouse. And initially kind of in an eight by 16 kind of a module. So, uh, 16, okay. you, oh, okay. you know, in, in the 16, you know, 16 times four, three or four, you could have, you know, you could maybe have six or so meter uh, kinds of, of panels, maybe maybe four of those kind of, they're about a meter wide, okay. these panels, right? So yeah, about one by two meters, something like that, roughly. That's yeah. So that's another thing that we would have available to us. Uh, and, and Steve's guys, there was a little bit of misunderstanding about what they were going to model, what they were going to sketch up and, and uh, but they, uh, they're looking at either uh, concrete columns kind of a structure or uh, essentially one of the things that, that Larry happened to mention too, it's, it's the C channel type of metal uh, members that are common in Guatemala and or Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll see what he comes up with, but those are, that's just another element in the mix there. I mean, typically for ground mounted, the, the kind of tried and true is to do your columns with I beams and then, um, Z, uh, like north south, uh, a Z purlin, um, you know, the Z channel, um, yeah, yeah. as a purlin, and oh. then the, the C channel as a, as a frame. So okay. you, you actually mount the panels to the C channel, which is kind of forgiving for where you, and then any, anywhere along the line, it doesn't, you know, it's a continuous member, so you can put it wherever it falls with the mounting hole. Um, and, so, and we can, we can add theft provision. Uh, prevention to that. We uh, found that we had a, a case of robbery in our little water system. Our brake pressure tanks, we had these big metal lids on them that had padlocks on them. And somebody cut the padlock and stole some of the pipes out of the inside of our oh, pressure no. tank. Yep. Yeah, so that's our first known theft uh, from our system. That's interesting. Yeah. So uh, Martin said that he's getting bigger padlocks, but that was, he, they, they took that before we actually installed our expensive float valves. So they didn't get the float valves anyway. So. Oh, wow. Well, that's too bad. Yeah. Um, so we just, we got to be aware of that. So uh, make sure our solar panels have theft prevention on them. Yeah. So it's right. So theft prevention on solar is kind of a tricky subject, right? I mean, one of the ways to make it theft proof is to put it on a roof. Um, you know, but if the people aren't home or whatever, then, you know, you know, there's ways to get around that. Um, yeah. you know, the other, the other way is to make it really hard to detach them, um, or even destructive to detach them by like welding the bolts to the frames. Mm -hmm. Um, so spot weld or something just so that which, somebody would need a cutting, they need some more complicated tools to get them off. Right. Or they would destroy well, it in the process. Yeah which definitely voids the warranty, but in this case, we're talking <laughs> about free panels. So yeah. you know, if you weld it to the frame, you know, in the name of security, I guess not the end of the world. Well, if you had kind of a lip, a angle iron or something that you around the frame sides, just so it um, two sides or something are enough so that it would be impossible to get them out without bending them too far or breaking them. Right. I mean that, yeah, and I certainly, certainly we can we can think of a a way to to accomplish that. Well, thanks for sharing the the theft incident, Phil. I hadn't heard of that. <laughs> yeah, it was an in, that the brake pressure tank right across from Zelida's house. So it's oh, not in the middle of nowhere. It's right where people are living. It's there. pretty. It's pretty. Uh, that's a pretty not a. Yeah, it's not a really secluded area out this, you know, at the end of been, a line all by itself or something. So yeah, it must have been in the middle of the night or actually. something. Yeah. Hmm. 
Um, if you don't have any other topics, I got one other thing I was going to bring up. Sure. Uh, in fact, let me share my screen a second. Uh, this is what we talked about at our meeting the other day. It's just some thoughts and I'd like to hear your input on it, Frank. Um, okay. If it comes up, here we go. Um, so we're just talking about, you know, we, or we have this model going where we have solar going and uh, we'll have backup to switch to, to grid in case there's a cloudy day. We also have a secondary worry that we wanna make sure we don't over pump our aquifer. So we're trying to keep the total volume to about 6,000 gallons a day, at least until we're comfortable that the aquifer can handle it. Mm -hmm. So just kind of noting that solar power is kind of var variable. Mm -hmm. And um, so we're gonna size our system so that on sunny days, so even if we get these 15 panels or something now, we may not hook them all up at first until we're sure that we know what the aquifer can handle it. We're gonna size it so that on most typical sunny days that it's only gonna pump out about 6,000 gallons. Yeah, we may be off plus or minus a thousand gallons, not a big deal. Um, and then we thought, okay, we'll have grid power on a timer and we'll schedule that for like five hours, say between 1 p.m. and 6 p.m. So in case the grid powers or the solar powers is all cloudy, at least we got full five hours of pumping. We can, in five hours, uh, going at the full 20 gallons a, a minute, it can get your 6,000 gallons. But if you look at a few different scenarios, so you got a sunny day, great. So the pump starts up early. It starts out at a low volume, increase, increases to max volume. I don't know what those volumes are, but whatever we size it at to give you a total of about 6,000 gallons. Great. Yeah. What if it's sunny in the morning and cloudy in the afternoon, pump starts up, and maybe it goes halfway and pumps 3,000 gallons, and the timer kicks on at one o'clock uh, because it gets too cloudy and the solar automatic switchover happens. And then we pump another 6,000 gallons, so we're pumping too much out, 9,000 gallons in that case, assuming, yeah. assuming that people are drawn down and the float switch doesn't kick in, which our tank is only 6,600 gallons, but assuming they're consuming 4,000 gallons a day or something anyway. Okay. Uh, and in the cases where it's partly cloudy all the time, it's maybe it's enough that the pump will trigger it, but not at a very high rate. So maybe it only runs all day and, and only until five o'clock or so and only pumps out 1500 gallons and the grid power comes on for an hour and pumps out 1200 gallons and that gives you only 2700 gallons. It's too low. Yeah. So how do you size it so that it works right without and, and still balancing or need to not over pump the aquifer? Yeah, no, thanks for outlining it. Yeah, that's a great, great question. So you got the answer for us. <laughs> Looking at those two things and then going um, with the survey. Yeah, so cool. I guess I would say, uh, no, I mean, th there's some operator uh, input required, right? If the operators, you know, are, you know, in the neighborhood and kind of monitoring the weather report, they can do better in the too high or too low scenario. Uh, they can adjust early. Um, if it's, you know, fully automated with the timer, um, I think the floats, the too high scenario, I'm not as worried about uh, because there is a float switch there. So, you know, it might be, it might be intermittently, you know, a day or two a week, there's a too high scenario, but it's not going to be catastrophically high and yeah. it's not going to be wasting water. Okay, the that's fair. Is a, is a maybe a bigger um, issue and that would just have to do with calibration of the settings, right? Like if it's, if it's the rainy season and it's been like a week or more and we haven't gotten our 6,000 for any day in a week, you know, or something, then, then maybe it's time to adjust that, that switch over threshold for how low, how, le how low of sun before we switch over, we, we can fiddle with that. Oh, okay. Is that something like the, the solar pack would have that you, you said it so don't kick this thing on until you get in at least, you know? Hopefully, yeah, hopefully that's configurable. Um, I Yeah, we go back to the man, it's been too long, my, yes. my brain is fried. But um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully there's a setting in there for the changeover, or, unless it's just like zero volts is the way to change it over, but. You could, you could in, in which case it wouldn't, wouldn't be the end of the world. You could kind of game the system by like 
drawing a blanket over the solar panels to make the grid work, but it was just <laughs> not do something so crude. Yeah. Uh, I would guess worst case that at the end of the day, if the tank is really low, somebody says, well, I'm going to manually turn the pump on for three hours. And or so if that, yeah, I suppose there's ways around it. The one nice way to do it, if we were like living next door to this thing and could be there to maintain this and make sure it was working right, was um, do a little logic, uh, a little Arduino or something mm -hmm. and calculate I think the, even the um, flow meter the, uh, that they put on at the well, it looks like the, looking at a spec sheet on it, it looks like it has an electrical output, pulse output on oh, the cool. stuff. So I think you could wire something up to count the pulses to get the, how much volume it is and with a little microprocessor there, um, calculate it, whatever it is, is uh, keep the either solar or electric going until you hit the 6,000 gallons and then shut it off <laughs> so yeah your, your way to guarantee it however you know we're not there something goes wrong on it it's a kind of a there's not a product out there that we could find that does that so it would be something we would be making up ourselves sounds like a great project for some yeah. student to go program but uh, just to maintain it and make sure there's not problems with it uh, uh, is a drawback to it yeah, it sounds like it's the classic thing that Larry would caution us. Every student chapter he works with wants to put in on our Arduino power, this or that to do. But on the other hand, Phil and I got quite excited. We watched uh, and, and talked with uh, an outfit that's uh, not unlike the, uh, the Digi that EOS is using for cellular modem pickup and, and, and relaying of data off right. their, their units. But this was a, a, a swarm of little sort of grilled cheese sandwich uh, size satellites that offers a, a low, uh, low uh, quantity of data sort of stuff, probably not useful for real-time monitoring, but useful for uh, real-time control, but useful for monitoring and, and evaluating data off these systems. So we were thinking that we might uh, have, to, have to look into that kind of a thing is just, just for the fun of it, if nothing else. Yeah, sure. No, I mean, that, also, that would be super neat. We also found exactly. some um, some batch metering valves, but we didn't quite see ones that again looked like they were just quite what, what we would need for this. But you know, you could envision in a process application if somebody needs to pump six thousands of re six thousand gallons of reagent into a thing and then stop metering them in, shut off the valve so that that doesn't happen anymore. That we could adapt something like this to our system. But again, it's a degree of complexity that uh, if we don't need, if we can work our way around it better not to have it yeah no it's the kind of the kind of logic in like i mean even in like chlorine dosing at, at water plants you know it's like once you have this many volumes you need this many milliliters of chlorine or whatever mm -hmm. you know, so it's like a very similar application i'm sure there's you know not that hard to to write the code but introducing a custom arduino and you know it, it just yeah it's inviting uh you know a problem well, this sounds like I'm glad you had a chance to run through those scenarios and get, get Frank's take on it, uh, Phil. So, yeah, that, that was good. Um, yeah, I guess that's about all I got then. The only um, thing uh, that I would have left is what's the best way for us for, is there something I can do to get us started with a quote uh, design field field memo that, that satisfies uh, Eric's request for documenting our solar package? Yeah, um, well, uh, could you, do you have in writing what it was that he asked for or is he just say to satisfy the requirements of this document? On the well, phone. he didn't even say satisfy the debate. The, he said that there are some resources there and mentioned the manual and basically just uh, what I had there from him was, uh, th these are my notes precisely, just do a, a little field change memo, a drawing, you know, drawing with the, he said, you guys do good drawings with the, the connections, the wire sizes. Um, for the solar pumping scenario, do a, an hourly or weekly kind of a extended storage uh, tank uh, performance analysis and that Larry and Frank should be very familiar with these <laughs> types of yeah. analyses. Yeah, no, probably, probably what would be best would be to do like a, 
daily kilowatt hours out of the solar array and then translate that along the pump curve to daily gallons. And then just say average, maybe, uh, maybe high and low, but average um, daily outputs over the, and then, you know, multiply that over the course of a week. Um, and yeah, give wire sizes. Um, I think that the, the thing that the mock-up uh, that uh, Phil did a while back, the flow chart of the different components. Right, we could use that. Could easily be adapted to a single line diagram or we could just call it a single line diagram. Yeah. Uh, with the way that that was illustrated. All right, well, why don't I go ahead and try and sketch that, get that, get that drafted as a straw man and then people can bleed on it and provide some intelligence as opposed to, I, I, got, I, I was famous in my tenure as a Lawrence Livermore group leader for at one point having told my group, I have no special intelligence on this matter and they never let me forget it. <laughs> <laughs> so if Frank, by the way, here's what we believe they installed the setup. Let me right. show you the photo of the, the, their box. So this is oh, super helpful. Yeah. This is the Siemens timer. I think this is the power relay I'm guessing. Not exactly sure what this thing is. This is the Fuji inverter, and they've got the Fuji inverter. In fact, they even trained the local committee on how to change the settings. So they've they did a bunch of tests to go and calibrate it. So they know it. I know it's 38 hertz gives you 10 gallons a minute, and they can they've got right. it set pre-programmed to either 10 gallons, 20 gallons, or 30 gallons, and the oh. caps knows how to change it. And it's under lock and key, so nobody can change it except either. Eugenio or Adelaida are the only two people who have keys to this cabinet here, which That's is wonderful. good. The timer, they say it requires a computer program and a technician to go change it. So right now they've got it set to turn on at 6 a.m. and turn off at 4 p.m. Um, and I'm not sure what these breakers are. I think maybe they are able to bypass the timer. So I'm thinking one of these switches maybe bypasses the timer. And I've got an email into um, Edgar at Bermosa to find out. So I, I think it looks like this is what I kind of put together. Yeah, probably one breaker comes from the panel and one breaker goes to the pump. If I had to yeah, I'm thinking that's probably the case. So it's probably another breaker here that I'm not showing in this dry diagram. It's an in, an input and an output. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, that's great. They, whoever put that little pump enclosure together did a nice job. A little bit of you know custom mounting and yeah, this was part way through, so I'm hoping maybe they dressed up the cables a little bit better afterwards, but even then it's still okay. No, the craftsmanship is fine. It looks like they put in extra slack. I had, Larry Bentley and I had a, had a system in Cameroon fail because we didn't leave enough slack from the underground line, so. Yeah, okay, good. good. Yeah, it was slack. And it looks like they've got a pancake fan to keep it cool here, too. Yep, and yep. I, I also like the way that the the O and M manual is being updated in real time. Phil's as building the uh, the O and M manual here as as yeah. This is it. the this is the O and M manual that I just sent out last <laughs> night. Yeah, I love it. I love it. That's great. Cool. Um, Very good. No, this this looks good. All right. Cool. Well, it's exciting to be here. I don't know if we if we showed. Did you get a chance to see the? Uh, Phil had a little video of uh, with with both Eugenio and uh, Martin, so the chair of the water board, along with our head mason and construction guy, splashing in one of the tap stands, and then he had two, uh -oh. three little girls at the school at a tap stand right across from it splashing in it. Did you see those? I no, <laughs> I'm I'm like embarrassingly behind on everything, but no. It's, I'll, if I'll you have a forward. second here. Bear with me just sure. a second. Let me see if I have them. If I do, I, I can. I think I got it up here. Let me. Oh, if you've got it, Phil, that's it. That's that's faster if Let's you have share it. Share with uh, sound and okay. Uh, let's see. No, I guess I don't have the. I don't have the I right. I have it here. Bear with me for a second because I think yeah. I've got. I may have closed it, but Your I think password. I've got. Uh, yeah. Let's see here, Phil. Let me yeah, see if okay. I can just. And, and actually, I don't know if, if Phil, I, I, I'm not sure if we also had shared this with. Uh, uh, can't remember whether we had shared this already with Frank or not, but this is, this is. Uh, yeah, this is at the oh, bottom God. of the wall. <laughs> That's right. No, I don't think I don't know if we shared that with Frank. 
Oh, what? So that's in the four inch casing. <laughs> We're not quite sure what these little boogers are, but you've already eaten lunch, right, Frank? <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> and this water has been tested three times and, and, and always tests just fine. <laughs> yeah. But this is the one with the little girls playing. Oh, nice. And then here's a, here's a Martin and Eugenio. Uh, <laughs> I think they're trying On to get Eveline note. wet. You're still trying to splash <laughs> Eveline, I think. That's, That's so good. Cool. So they're pretty pumped. Yeah, sure. <laughs> they're good, good they're really excited. Good stewards there. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. Well, you guys, thanks so much. Uh, and it's just a real treat to see Dominic. Frank and I can't believe how relaxed and chill he's been there. Yeah, he, he's great. He's great. He's uh, his his due date. Yeah, he's well. He's he was born. He was born like a month early, basically. Oh, so wow. he's uh, five weeks and one day old today, and wow. uh, his due date was like three and a half weeks into his life. So he's, he's like <laughs> a little bit less sleepy than he was that like first month of you know, when he was still third trimester, but yeah. arms. but now he's like kind of fourth trimester. So he's like, he's still not sure. <laughs> Good. But he's got this cute little dinosaur outfit on. Oh, isn't that <laughs> cool? <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. Well, Phil, I was just telling him just, you know, just keep in mind, it goes by in a blink. How old are yours now, Phil? Uh, 32 and 28. Yeah, Something like that. Mine are 38 yeah. and 36. Uh, and so it just warms my heart, Frank. Well, you guys, this, this sounds terrific. Thank you all so much. Uh, I, I really, uh, I think the, the, the uh, I, I told Phil that I've started the uh, post implementation trip report to just uh, the guidance we had from Eric Lundberg was just to kind of dust off what we had before and update it with the progress that's taken us to here. So I'll have that ready pretty quick so we can get that. Uh, submitted and then I think that in the remote implementation mode we just launch a new trip and then put in a new uh, uh, plan to do our assessment trip and then we sick the country office and the and our partners on doing the assessment which is looking for sources and ways to get water higher up uh, uh, to the houses and couldn't serve with this one and then and maybe there'll be something else that emerges we, they showed us some really good bridge opportunities on our way out of town <laughs> So there are, there are other projects as well. And so, all yeah. right, you guys, anything else we want to cover? Yeah, no, I would just say um, on the Eric thing, the field note, the, the, if you guys, if, if there's a, a document you want me to add that into, or if there's a, a template you want me to work from. Um, I, I'll, I'll get something started. Maybe I can just uh, go ahead and, and provide, I'll, I'll take a look and see whether I could just use it like a little, maybe use an implementation plan template and just kind of shorten it up and, and use something that's kind of stock, but familiar looking. Yeah, no, that's, that's fine. And they, I think the bare minimum is just to take the Berkeley solar calcs, you know, a, 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 appendix that and then appendix Phil's diagram, but, you know, add some wire sizes in between. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's it, you know, yeah, uh, for the most part, but you know, we can make it, you know, add a, a half page right up and make it look pretty. Okay, sounds good. I'll get that started for us. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Good. Sure. Take Thanks. Care. Take care. Good to see you guys.